Hi there, and welcome to this lesson on Pure Mathematics 3. And in this lesson, we're going to be introduced to the exponential function e to the power of x. In the last lesson, we considered functions which have the general form f of x is equal to some number a to the power of x. And we discovered that if a is bigger than 1, then all of these functions look exactly the same as each other. They all have the same form as this graph below where they cross the y-axis at 1, because anything to the power of 0 is 1. They get bigger and bigger without limit as x increases, and they get smaller and smaller without limit as x decreases. And this doesn't really give a very good impression of how quickly they increase. Exponential functions don't just increase, they do increase very quickly. The other thing we should note is that as x increases in value, two things increase. Both the value of x does, so y gets bigger and bigger and bigger as x increases, but also the gradient does. The gradient gets steeper and steeper and steeper as we progress along the curve. So both things are increasing. Now it turns out that there is one particular value of a where both y and the gradient, dy by dx, they increase at exactly the same rate as each other. Now, that value is an infinite decimal, which begins 2.71828. It's like pi in that it's got a, an infinitely long decimal, which has no pattern to it at all. It's an irrational number. And like pi, it has a special name. And the letter used for this number is the letter E. So E equals 2.71828, roughly. And if you were to draw the graph of y equals e to the x, it's just like any other value of um, a to the power of x. Crosses the y-axis at 1, and like you can see here, it increases without limit as x gets bigger. It decreases without limit as x gets smaller. And that maybe is a slightly more true impression on that graph of how quickly the graph increases. Now, what do we mean when we say that the y values and the gradient increase at the same rate. It's more than they increase at the same rate, they also start at the same value. So if we consider x equals 0, at x equals 0, the y coordinate on the curve is 1, because e to the power of 0 equals 1. If we were to work out the gradient at that point, the gradient would also equal 1. So the y value is 1, the gradient is 1. That's also true if we look at x equals 1. The y value there will be e, e to the power of 1. If we were to calculate the gradient of the curve, that would also be e. So the y value is e, the gradient is e. They're the same as each other. If we looked at 2, the y value would be e squared, and the gradient would be e squared. Now, this is true at every single point on the curve. At every point, the value of y and the value of the gradient they are exactly the same as each other. Now, what does this mean? It has a really, really important consequence for gradients and for differentiation and integration. It means that for all real values of x, if I have the function y equals e to the x, if I differentiate that, it won't change. I'll still have e to the x, because the y value, e to the x, the gradient, e to the x, they're exactly the same as each other. So when I differentiate this function, it does not change. In function language, if f of x is e to the x, then f dash of x is e to the x. When I differentiate the function, it doesn't change. Now, this is the only function that that is true for. e to the x is the only function that does not change when you differentiate it. And that turns out to be very, very useful. If you have something slightly more complicated, like y equals e to the power of kx, where k is a constant, then we use the chain rule to differentiate that. First of all, you differentiate the e. When you differentiate e, nothing happens. It stays the same. So you still get e to the kx. Um, it's a function of a function. The first function is e. The second function is k times by x. So when you then differentiate k times x, you'll just get k. So if y equals e to the kx, dy by dx will equal e to the kx, that's differentiating the e, nothing happens, and then times by k. That's what you get when you differentiate k times by x. 
tidying that up gives you ke to the kx. Now I'll let you have a go at using this yourself to see if you can make sense of what's going on here. So three examples, have a go at them yourself, pause the video, and then come back to me again when you're ready. Okay, let's have a look at these. Now with these you can choose, you either use the chain rule or you can just use the formula that we just derived. Looking at the first question, y equals e to the 3x, when I differentiate that, first of all, I get e to the 3x because nothing changes when I differentiate e. Then I've got to differentiate 3x. And when I differentiate 3x, I'll get 3. So dy by dx will equal 3 times by e to the 3x. The second one looks more complicated, but exactly the same thing happens. When I differentiate e to the minus 2 thirds x, first of all, I differentiate the e. Nothing changes. I just get e to the minus 2 thirds x. Then I differentiate the minus 2 thirds x. And that gives me dy by the x is equal to minus 2 thirds times by e to the minus 2 thirds x. The third one where we're multiplying by 5, what you're really using here is the rule for a function multiplied by a function. So strictly speaking, you'd write down e to the 2x and differentiate 5, that will give you 0. And then you write down the 5 and differentiate the e to the 2x. Now when I write down 5 and differentiate e to the 2x, you just get 5 times by exactly what I did on the previous examples. So you'll have 5 times by e to the 2x when I differentiate the e, then times by 2 when I differentiate the 2x. So you'll have 5 times by e to the 2x times by 2. And tidying that up gives us 10 e to the 2x. Okay, second example. Just ask you to sketch both of these curves just to see how they relate to each other. So on the same set of axes, sketch y equals e to the x and then y equals e to the 3x. Noting the coordinates of the intersection points with the axes and also write down the equations of any asymptotes. Have a go yourself, pause the video, come back when you're ready. Okay, not much going on here. So first of all, y equals e to the x. Well, that's just like any other number to the power of x. It looks exactly as we've been drawing it up to now crossing point of 1 and that sort of shape. e to the 3x. Now, e to the 3x, there's a couple of ways of thinking about it. In terms of translations, we've times the x value by 3. Now, if you times all the x values by 3, what you get is a stretch with a scale factor a third in the x direction. So the graph's going to squeeze inwards towards the y-axis with a scale factor of a third. What that means is that every single point on the curve will only be a third of the distance away from the y-axis. And you'll get something that looks like that. And notice that this intersection point here hasn't changed. Uh, it's still at 1. Um, e to the power of 3x. Again, if x is 0, you'll just have e to the power of 0, which is 1. And also the asymptote has not changed. The asymptote is still the x-axis. And the graph just gets closer and closer and closer to the x-axis as x gets smaller. Okay, example three, same idea. So again, on the same set of axes, have a go at sketching both of these. e to the minus x, that's a reflection of e to the x in the y-axis. And then on the same axis, sketch y equals 4e to the minus x. So pause the video, have a go, come back when you're ready. Okay, first of all, e to the minus x. Now, as I was saying, e to the minus x is a reflection of y equals e to the x in the y-axis. So it looks like the same thing, but flipped over in the y-axis. Crossing point is still 1, but now it gets bigger and bigger as x decreases, and it gets smaller and smaller and smaller as x increases. y equals 4e to the minus x. Again, there's various ways of thinking about this. One is in terms of stretches. We're timesing the whole function by four. Now that means that we're gonna get a stretch with scale factor four in the y direction. It means that every single point is gonna move four times as far from the x-axis. Now the significant one to follow is this intersection point. At the moment, it's one unit from the x-axis. When I times y by four, that's going to become four times as far 
four units away from the x-axis. So the crossing point will be there. And the impression is that it's all become a little bit steeper, a little bit quicker. And the asymptote is still the x-axis. Again, that hasn't changed. As x increases in value, you'll notice that the green curve, again, it just gets closer and closer to zero. OK, example four. And this is the last example. This time, there's a progression of three curves. They're related to each other again. So sketch all three on the same set of axes and just notice how they relate to each other. First of all, e to the half x. Then timesing that by 5, 5e five e to the half x, and then adding on 2, 2 plus 5e e to the half x. Again, note the coordinates of the intersection points and write down the equations of any asymptotes. Pause the video, come back to me when you're ready. Okay, let's have a look at these last three. First of all, e to the half x doesn't really make any difference in terms of how it looks. It still just looks exactly the same as e to the x. So e to the half x still crosses the y-axis of 1 and still has the same general shape. 5 times e to the half x, that's a bit like the question we did just now. That'll be a stretch in the y direction with scale factor 5. So every point is going to be 5 times as far away from the x-axis. And the significant point to follow is this intersection point here. Instead of being at 1, it'll now move up to five, so that it's five units away from the x-axis. And you'll get something that looks a bit like that. And then the third thing we were asked to do is a translation in the y direction, where we add on to to the whole function. That means that the whole function is going to move vertically upwards by two units. It's worth with these types of functions following the asymptote first. So at the moment, the asymptote is the x-axis. When we add two to the whole function, that asymptote is gonna move vertically upwards by two units. So rather than having an asymptote at the x-axis, we'll have an asymptote around here where y is equal to two, two units higher up. And the other thing you'll notice at this crossing point here at five, that also moves two units further up. So we get an asymptote here at y equals two. And this crossing point at five also moves up two units to seven. Now we can sketch the curve and it'll look something like that, approaching the line y equals two as x gets smaller and smaller. Okay, that gets us to the end of this lesson. If you've got the textbook, then turn to page 107 and have a go at exercise 5b. Thank you very much for listening and cheerio.